If you're just joining us, uh, welcome to Managing the Online Teaching Workload Workshop. And we just covered a few tech check slides, and now we can go ahead and start moving into the content. So now that I've introduced myself, I'd love to hear from you. Um, again, feel free to just utilize the text chat unless you prefer the microphone, but um, your name, what you teach, and do you have any goals for this workshop? And I'll let you type for just a couple of minutes. Hi, Alicia, welcome. Uh, we were just doing some introductions, so great to have you with us. Um, all right, wow, I see some different answers here. Biomechanics, motor learning, and statistics. Anything, um, any strategy that will aid in making your courses more efficient? Math and science for early childhood major students. Oh, that's interesting. All right, so more strategies for managing the workload for online teaching. Well, I will aim to deliver. All right, so in this workshop, um, I have kind of three um, general goals and then I have also divided it up into three sections. But um, in this workshop, we're gonna see if we can discover some practical strategies, things you can actually use to save some time some of your time um, to help you manage student expectations and just to increase your overall efficiency as an instructor. Um, and I do know that everyone's attention gets pulled in a lot of different directions, so we'll see if we can come up with some useful strategies. Oh, that's okay, Alicia. Yes, you were muted, but welcome. Glad to have you. All right. Well, I thought I would just start off with asking you a question. So, um, you know, since you're all here now, um, maybe just go ahead and type in the, the text area there, or if you prefer the microphone, you can come on the mic. But um, in your opinion, what do you find to be the most difficult aspect of managing the online teaching workload? Really no right or wrong answers. No problem. We're recording this workshop if you have to pop in or out. Um, I can always send you the, the recording if you miss anything. All right, so assessment, um, grading. So are these both kind of like time management? Multiple deadlines and providing timely feedback. Great. So the reason I ask is because I know that we we do juggle a lot of things when we're teaching. Um, so I, I did try to actually kind of emulate the, the juggle that happens here. Um, so you've got to have your office hours. There's the time that you actually spend teaching. Yes, emails. I think this is going right along with uh, Alicia's comment here, knowing whether you should be reminding students of their work responsibilities. Um, 
Faculty development could be things like this right now. You're in a workshop, you know, um, these things all pop up all over the place. I, I remember hearing once upon a time that I should be a teacher because they, they've got such a light workload and they get summers off. And, and I think that was complete nonsense. So um, of course you have to, when you're teaching online, then you have to create an entire course online um, in Blackboard, the grading, which I know we already touched on. Um, and, and of course I, I do have this one down here in the bottom left corner where you design um, and align those course elements. So that's kind of some of the pre-planning before you even hop into a Blackboard course. So I know um, just how many different directions you're being pulled all at once. And great, I see another person joined us. Welcome, Jennifer, you're right on time. Yeah, hi, hi there, Megan, thanks. <laughs> So today, um, I, I know that, you know, as we're trying to think of ways that we can manage this workload, be more efficient, save some time, um, I divided this up really into three different segments for this workshop. Um, so we're going to start with the design, and that's really all of the pre-planning that goes into your online course before you even get to interact with your students. Um, then there's the delivery. So the facilitation, if you will, and arguably grading goes hand in hand with facilitation, but just to make it more manageable, I kind of made it its own uh, third segment of this pie. So we're gonna take a look at all three of those, those pieces, because I think um, at any given moment, one of those could just become um, kind of a monster to manage. And, and so we're gonna look at some different strategies. All right, so the course design process. So one of the first things that I wanted to focus on here is going ahead and managing your course by pre-planning it out on paper. I think the temptation with an online course is as soon as you can, you request your course in Blackboard and you automatically start building in your Blackboard course. Or maybe even if it's a course that you've taught in the past, then you might just go ahead and copy your course, right? And then you're just gonna start to make tweaks and edits. Um, but you can actually kind of get lost um, in, in that process. And so it's really nice to have an outline first of your course design. So I have up here, this is actually a document that our instructional design team uses. And if you ever want a blank copy of this course design uh, plan, just let us know, we can send that to you. So I, I think I put it at the bottom of the slide here just to email us um, and let us know. But this is actually an example that was filled out by our team when we were building a academy, which emulates kind of the online classroom experience. So we had to write out the description, we had to come out with the overall course learning objectives, right? And then on this side, uh, this is where we started getting into modules. So if you are teaching a traditional 16 week course, then you may end up having 16 modules. That's a very common uh, theme. But the nice part here is that we created smaller learning objectives for each module. Um, we listed out all of the readings and media resources that we wanted to use. Okay, and then we um, have a separate block just for activities and assignments. Uh, there's optional activities as well and anything else that maybe we forgot. Uh, so if you go ahead and you're able to fill out a course design uh, document like this, you'll find that building, I think, in Blackboard goes a lot quicker. You won't be second guessing yourself. Oh, did I put that in the right folder? Um, so this is really a, a nice thing that you can try to fill out. Sometimes we don't have as much preparation time as we would like to build our online courses. Um, but in that case, I would tell you maybe try to keep one to two weeks ahead of your students and, and you can still uh, fill out your design document um, as you go along throughout your course. So this one, I know you're, you're so tempted just to hop into Blackboard, but I really um, promise you this will save you a lot of time and energy um, and it's gonna make you feel so much more organized. Another thing that you may want to try to use, um, we have come up with, the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning has come up with course templates. So um, 
If you've never used one of these course templates, it, it truly is uh, just something that's meant to be customized, but it's a great starting point if you're brand new to Blackboard Ultra or if this is a new course. It has um, all these different placeholders for where you can insert maybe your syllabus and another place where you can insert your schedule. Um, and then we have you know, a sample module with folders broken up to help organize your content. But again, if you don't need something, you could delete it. Or if you need something else, you can add it. Um, so again, it's just this idea that it's fully customizable, but it's a template just to help you get your online course organized format-wise. Has anybody ever used any of these templates before? Yes, yeah, I, Alicia. I've used them. Oh, sorry. No, I, I was just raising my hand to indicate that I have used them. Oh, awesome. Thanks. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I, I do like the templates. I, I think it's, again, another time saver. Um, so and there is, of course, this link down at the bottom of the slide. If I'm going too fast, uh, please don't panic. I promise I will send a follow up email with all sorts of um, links for content today. Excellent. Well, hopefully then um, if you've used these, then I hope that they they were beneficial. So again, to go along with those templates, um, trying to create maybe an intuitive to navigate course, intuitive being the keyword from maybe the student's perspective. So um, whatever format that you go with, just try to be consistent. So oftentimes we think of weekly modules, but I've also seen courses where uh, the modules were based on specific chapters or themes. Um, so as long as you're consistent, I think students are going to, to be okay to navigate your course. Uh, once a module is open, a good practice is just to keep it open. Don't, don't let it lock. Um, have a separate syllabus and set and schedule. Um, this is just nice for students if they want to download it or save it to their personal device. Um, so it, it's nice to have two separate files. And then of course, consistent due dates. So for instance, I, I think I mentioned earlier that I'm in a grad program that's entirely online. One of the things that I love is that my instructors are consistent with due dates. I have one class where everything is due at 11.59 p.m. on Sundays, and my other instructor preferred 11.59 p.m. on Mondays. So it really didn't matter to me what day things were due. I just loved knowing that all assignments have kind of this consistent pattern. It'll cut down on the amount of emails that you get from your students, by the way. So that's how that one saves you some time. I know we're getting ready to move everybody to Blackboard Ultra in the spring. I think we're at about a 70, 75 percent adoption rate across NIU. So um, I think many of you are already teaching in Ultra. But again, if you ever want to refer back to um, best practices or how to, to use something in Blackboard, we have a self-paced um, Ultra Transition workshop. So you can just kind of go through the contents here um, and see maybe how to build something in Blackboard Ultra. Um, and that can probably save you a lot of time as opposed to trying to rifle through YouTube tutorials. We also have a web page for the new features that keep coming out in Ultra. And I think, again, this is going to help you just manage your, your workflow because you'll know um, all the new features that are coming. So whenever they finally add surveys, this is where we're going to highlight that, that big feature. Um, but they always talk about new things in the grade book um, and just organization uh, features that will help you manage your Blackboard course. And of course, we always have, if you just want direct help, we don't want you to struggle. Um, so just feel free to ask for help at CIDL. We, we play with Blackboard all day long. Um, and, and we also kind of infuse maybe some pedagogical practices in there. So you can request a one-on-one -on -one consultation. And um, we'll just ask you, you know, what do you want to talk about? Is it about Blackboard? Do you, do you want to talk about exams or, you know, 
Do you want to talk about student engagement? And when you schedule your consultation, it'll be for a virtual consultation for one hour if you need the full hour. Otherwise, um, you know, we're just happy to, to help you with whatever questions you have on your mind. Okay. So I think we're doing well with time here and we can move into the delivery or the facilitation of your online course. So when your students actually enter the classroom and you get to interact with them. So one of the things um, that we have to work with our students on is the regular and substantive interaction policy. And so um, the reason that I bring this up is because we have to think of ways to interact with our students. It is, um, not only a best practice, it is a, a federal policy, um, but we also have to be mindful of how much time this is going to take um, as far as our you know, interactions with them go, as well as our grading, which is coming up next. Um, so if you're curious about what meets the uh, regular and substantive interaction policy, I will again share the link. I know it's kind of long, um, but this is NIU's uh, support page for regular and substantive interaction. And they actually have used some really good examples of, of how you can meet this policy. Um, for instance, I know in the past I've had faculty who were concerned that if they used a discussion board and they didn't respond to every post that they would not meet the uh, requirement. And that is not true. So you do have to keep an eye on the discussion board, maybe pepper in a couple of replies here and there to keep it moving forward, um, but you are not obligated to reply to every single post, which if you have a large roster, I know is very important. All right, so my next question for you, you can just type this in the chat. Um, What's your process for responding to your student emails? Um, do you have a, a schedule? Do you wing it? What does that look like to you? Great, I, I love all the different answers. And I think the reason that I asked is one that I really don't think there is a right or a wrong answer, but I think it's sometimes good just to share this information with others. Um, because I, I think we've gotten so attached to our electronics, right? Even when you are when you put your laptop away, you still have your cell phone and, and all of a sudden you can see these emails coming in. And one of the things that happens when you teach online is sometimes you feel like you're on call all the time. Um, so some of you are winging it, some of you say you try to respond within 24 hours except on the weekends, mornings on the weekday, no emails on the weekends or after 4.30. Um, somebody else said, you know, I respond immediately when I see the email, but maybe I should have a schedule. So there is a lot of variance in this. Um, I think I would start a conversation with your students about um, time. And that could be one of the conversations that you have about your email response time. Um, so these are some other conversations you you might wanna have with them. Um, and they're also things you may wanna put in your syllabus. So what are some other things that we can talk about? Well, what days do you expect your students to meet? When do you respond? Um, I have some samples coming up here in just a moment, so I'll show you some of those as well. What is your grading turnaround time? Again, I don't really think there's a right or a wrong answer other than we want to be fairly timely, right, so that our students can track their grades uh, throughout the semester. 
Um, but some people might need three days, some people might need five days. I, I think as long as you're consistent and you tell your students what that um, schedule looks like, I, I think that students are going to be pretty reasonable with that. Something else you might want to talk about is um, what is the outside work expectation? How many hours should they be studying outside of your class time? And this can even evolve further if your course is fully asynchronous. Um, how much time should they be studying? Just um, what would it be the equivalent if they had you know, synchronous classes? Um, and then how much time on top of that do they need to study? And you might even consider adding estimated time needed to complete an activity or to complete a module. Not all weeks are the same in our courses. So, um, you know, trying to, to prepare your students how much time they're going to need um, to set aside can, can cut down on the amount of panicked emails that you receive. All right. So I know we said we're, we're still in the facilitation mode right now. Uh, so Alicia asked, is there a good way to measure estimated time to uh, complete a module? You can give them maybe a range based on um, how many activities or assessments are in the module. So um, depends how granular you want to get with it. But um, usually the, the rule of thumb, and again, you, you could um, take a look at your own individual course, is that uh, people will say maybe two to three hours of outside study time per credit hour. So, um, you know, if you have a three credit hour course, right, um, you're looking anywhere from about six to nine hours of outside study time. But I don't think um, students always know that, so. Is there a, a good way to uh, for instance, determine how long, let's say, an individual an individual assessment or activity takes. I kind of have the same issue when I'm devising exams. Like I think it should take them 50 minutes, and two hours later, if I allow them extra time, they're still wanting more time. So mm -hmm. I, I have a hard time just in general trying to figure out how long something should take. Are there any uh, tips or resources or s something that I could use to help with that? I think it's going to depend a little bit on what type of assessment you have. For instance, if you had a multiple choice exam, it could be easier to estimate because you might tell students, you know, if you've already reviewed your notes um, and you go into this um, exam prepared, you know, maybe you should take anywhere between one minute to a minute and 30 seconds per question, right? That, that seems like kind of like a, a natural pace. Um, if you have an essay, essays can take longer or shorter um, depending on, on just writing styles. So um, at that point, I might look at uh, what, what have they already completed um, moving up to that essay? Have they already done a rough draft? Um, that kind of a thing. Okay, thank you. Sure. But I would tell students, um, again, because I, I know it can be difficult to gauge this, right? Everybody learns at a slightly different pace, and so you hate to put a quantifiable number on things. But um, if you talk to your students about that expectation that there should be anywhere between six to nine hours of outside study time per week for a three-credit hour course, um, that can help them adjust their schedules. Um, if you know that you have a week where there is a lot of content, you could tell them this might be the nine hour week. Um, but you know, you may also have some some weeks where it's a little bit lighter, right? We're going into the Thanksgiving holiday. I know a lot of faculty tend to cut back because they know people are already traveling for the holiday. Um, so if you can work with your students to just to try to help them manage their workload, um, I, I think in turn, you're going to see fewer of those uh, concerned emails coming in at the last minute. But that's a great question, and it's difficult to navigate. Uh, but we can always try. 
Um, you can even ask students um, how long it took them for a particular assignment. If you're not sure how long it took them, um, I would start distributing uh, surveys and ask them for some feedback. Okay, thanks. Those are all good. I think the reminding them, at least reminding for some or you know, uh, letting them know the three, two to three hours per class hour is really three for engineering. I'm engineering and it's, it's generally mm -hmm. three hours uh, per class. So nine hours yeah. of study time per week minimum outside of, of what. Uh, I don't tend to remind them of that uh, that much, but in my mind, when I'm preparing work, I'm cognizant of it. So. I think that's the first uh, uh, suggestion that I can implement right away and it'll go the furthest. So thank you. Sure. Um, but again, going back to that facilitation part of, of managing our, our workload, one of the other things that I hear from online faculty specifically is that sometimes they they feel like they're talking into the abyss. It becomes a lecture every time they, they have an synchronous meeting, um, or if it's asynchronous, they feel like they're just recording lecture after lecture, um, and, and they're not sure if their students are, are really engaging with the content. So a great way to make sure that they are engaged is to ask them to connect with one another. So I do highly recommend that you utilize the peer review. This is also a Blackboard Ultra setting. Um, so if you've never used this before, it it's set up so that you um, come up with two different due dates. So there's the due date for the initial submission, right? Like maybe I want my students to write a draft or maybe I want them to work on a worksheet. So they're gonna turn in their first submission on that first date. Then there's the due date for the um, last submission. After they've turned in their first submission, um, then the system will automatically um, distribute their, their peers' drafts as well. Um, and so that second due date is when they have to provide feedback by. So it, it's really kind of nice. It is anonymous from the student perspective. It is not anonymous from the instructor perspective. So at any given time, you can go into the grade book and you can see the feedback that the students wrote. You can see who said what, um, you know, and, and that gives you kind of this nice level to regulate and make sure that everybody stays on track, that they are providing, you know, critical feedback, but um, also making sure that they are being sensitive to the fact that, you know, this is somebody else's work and just making sure that they have kind of that level of professionalism when they, they review each other's work. Also, the instructor chooses the number of reviews. So, um, you know, maybe you want each student to review three other drafts, or maybe you only want them to do two or one. So um, you choose the number, but the, the deal here is that students must submit their own original submission before they're allowed to review anybody else's. Has anybody um, worked with the, the peer review at all? I have, um, and I like it. It goes quite well. The only um, snag or hold up, and this is not just peer review, but this is with any assignment that requires a student to respond or review someone else's work is um, I'll have students who like to jump on things right away and they will do the first portion immediately. But when the majority of the students wait until 1158 to do something, then that takes away from the amount of time that you know, you have to respond to someone else's. And so I I struggle, especially when it comes to, let's say, discussion boards, um, how, to, like, when do I have a cutoff for um, submitting for responding? So like right now, it'll say, for example, respond by Sunday with your initial you know, answer, and then by Wednesday or by Thursday, respond to two other. Um, mm -hmm. But for whatever reason, it's happened that, oh, I know what it is. Uh, 
students will some students will respond by Sunday. The rest of the students, for whatever reason, decide that they don't need to respond by Sunday, that they wait until the Wednesday or the Thursday, and they try to do both sets of responses. So those who have responded when they should have are now uh, unable to respond to other people's because they're not in. So from gotcha. my perspective, it's like, how do I... Uh, do I say to those who responded on time for the first one, okay, if no one has responded, let's say by Wednesday, if it's due on Thursday, then you don't have to, like, I don't, I'm, it's still an enigma in how to manage that part of it. Well, um, two things come to mind with the um, peer review. You won't have that issue because, again, um, if you look at the example that I have um, up here on the screen now, granted, I know it's from last year. It says 2022. But the idea here was that um, their first draft was due on, you know, 927. Mm -hmm. And if they didn't turn anything in by 927, then they would not see any of the other um, submissions. So they, they couldn't review their peers' work. So they couldn't sneak in. So the peer right. review um, cuts down on that as far as discussion boards go. Um, you could always just do one discussion board and say that your uh, first response is due, you know, 927. And you can tell them that there's a second discussion board that is due on 10-3. Um, and I would just make it a conditional requirement that people cannot get into the the 10-3 discussion board if they haven't if they didn't participate in the 927 one. Okay. So uh, that's always another possibility. It's like where if once they complete one assignment, it unlocks the other one. Right. Okay. I'm so I'm looking at the uh, I think that works. I was just trying to remember if I've had that issue with peer review, but it will show up differently. Um, so my general policy is I do accept late work. Um, mm -hmm. So I think at least with uh, peer review, if I say submit by Tuesday uh, and someone doesn't submit by Tuesday, in their mind, they're fine. They're choosing to take the penalty for late work, but mm -hmm. maybe they still don't submit in enough time that a person who did submit by Tuesday can now review because it's not in. And the challenge here is my classes are very small. So it's not like I have a 40 student thing and it's not likely that I'll come across this. This particular class is only five students. And so if four of them are waiting until the 19th hour to do it, then the one person who is making sure they're doing everything early sometimes gets left out in terms of being able to complete. Uh, yeah, yeah, I understand that. And I, I think, you know, just using those sequential rules will help students um, th that'll have to go, they can still, even if they're late, you can still allow them to do late work, whether you have a penalty or not, that's up to you on an individual basis. But mm -hmm. it will help students keep going down that path where you want them to submit this first before they try to jump into another assignment. Right. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So I do have five tips for lightening this burden of teaching online because I don't think that it should always fall on you as the instructor. You're not a, a paid actor. You're not there to entertain your students. Um, you're there to facilitate this environment uh, where they're actively engaged. So it's great to bring in guest speakers. It gives you a break and students are excited to hear other voices. So uh, don't be shy about bringing in other speakers periodically into your course. Kind of going along with that idea of the flipped classroom environment, try to incorporate student presentations. Um, it, it isn't just up to you to um, lead a lecture every single day. And in fact, uh, online environments aren't always conducive to lecture environments. So asking students to lead a discussion is, is a great way to redistribute some of this workload. My third one here, I call them exit slips. Um, 
people have different names for these things, but um, the exit slips really, are, they're this idea that um, students have to give you some feedback. And so you could do this at the end of a module, you could do it at the end of a synchronous um, session, but instead of just waiting until the end of the course to, to look at the student evaluations, um, ask your students a couple of questions. And it's up to you, again, whether you want this to be anonymous or with student names on it, I've seen it go both ways. Um, but ask your students some things like, what did you find most helpful? Um, what is still confusing? Is there anything else you want to tell me? Um, and if you use some kind of combination of those three questions, you'll usually get some feedback from students on what they found effective about your course um, and, and some areas where they're still struggling. Um, and so it's easier to address um, areas where they're, where they're having some some difficulties um, instead of waiting until the end of the course. I also like the idea of incorporating some asynchronous activities. Um, maybe ask your students to have already completed some things on their own before coming to a synchronous course. Um, again, asking your students to, to do some outside work um, is not unreasonable. So, you know, we often think about it. Like, I, I teach English, so um, I know that if I ask my students to read something, if there is no quiz, um, honestly, they're probably not going to read it. So um, again, I might ask them to, to read outside of class and I'll just be upfront and let them know that there's going to be a quiz over that reading. Um, that way then I know they're gonna show up to my class prepared. So um, don't be afraid to ask them to do specific functions outside of class. Just make sure that you, you follow up those asynchronous activities. And again, I do like the idea of peppering in discussion board replies. Um, this is just a, a great way to, to get to communicate with your students kind of all at once. Um, you can do um, discussion boards for the entire course, or you can even do things like self-enroll discussion boards where you have kind of three different topics and you ask them to enroll in the one, you know, that most appeals to them. Um, so that, that's a way for you just to kind of lighten your, your workload where you don't feel like you have to reply to every single assignment. Um, you can just kind of pop in and out of these various discussion boards. Okay, so I, I know before earlier I had mentioned um, that I have some examples here for you on how you can communicate your expectations for communication. So this is actually not my, um, my syllabus, but I, I did uh, borrow this from, from a friend. Um, so here you can see that this is uh, directly from their, their syllabus. They have their professional background. Um, and then they have communication expectations. Um, they, they said, hey, students, you know, this is what you can expect from me. Um, also, these are my expectations from you. And so they divided it into two segments here. So um, according to this instructor, they, um, they will check their account regularly. They are going to respond within 48 hours minus the weekend. Um, and they're going to post announcements to their um, Blackboard page. Um, and they're also going to um, send the announcements also via email. So, and you can see their expectations for the students. Um, they want professional formatted emails. I think that's actually a nice touch. It, it gets students away from uh, sending you emails that look like text messages to their friend. Um, and they said to please avoid emailing at the last minute, see the 48 hour response notice above. Uh, they also have an away message that they, they use for their Outlook um, email. And I, I've really started to learn to adopt this. I, I was very hesitant to do so, uh, but I, I think it's actually made my life feel more manageable. It feels like there's a certain time where I'm teaching and I'm grading and I'm responding to emails. And then there's a certain period of time, you know, in the evenings where I do not have to look at that email. You know, I can just, in, I can enjoy my meal in peace. I do also like on here, um, it says you're welcome to email me at any time. Um, I respond during you know, regular business hours, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Um, this is particularly helpful because a lot of online students, they're, they're traveling, 
Um, I was in a class where one of my peers was in China. I, you know, I think his emails came in like very odd hours of the day. Um, and so it was just a nice way to say like, hey, I understand, you know, what time works best for you might not work best for me, um, but you can send me your message and um, I'll get to it in the morning. So I know we kind of talked about this already. Um, did anybody else have a, a different answer though when we were talking about, uh, you know, rules of thumb for what is the expected amount of outside study time? I said six to nine hours for a three credit hour course. Um, if you've heard something different, uh, let me know. I, I think that's just kind of a generic estimate. Um, some instructors say, you know, if I'm working with grad students, it might be longer. Great, okay. I feel like this is something that we as instructors know, but sometimes we forget to have that conversation with students, so. Um, Okay, we're down to about 15 minutes, so I think we've got time to get through our grading slides here. Um, I feel like this is always the big reveal. This is the one that everybody wants to know the most about, so here we go. I recommend staggering uh, the grading flow, and so a good way to do this is one, going back to um, one of our earlier slides when I talked about um, using a course plan document, if you actually write out what students have to do each week of the course, it helps you to actually stagger the grading flow. You're going to see how much time they need um, each week or, or you know, how many big assignments you're assigning each week um, because that also has an impact for you as an instructor. You can't be grading huge piles of essays every single week or you know you can't be grading huge piles of exams every single week um, so staggering the grading flow um, is going to help your students it's also going to help you so uh, try to look at it kind of almost from an aerial view so right here I've got a picture of the calendar um, if you actually take a look at when things are being assigned and when they're due it's going to help you um, decide how to distribute these large assignments so don't be afraid to tell your students that it's not going to be the same every single week um, you know there are going to be periods of time, maybe at midterms and finals where it's heavier. Um, but, you know, there's also going to be some some weeks where you can kind of take a, a slight breather, right? One of the other things that I like to do that's going to help save time, um, and it's also good for consistency um, and, and building some unbiased grading practices is um, First, you may want to, in your assignments, hide the student names. I, I know we always think we're unbiased, um, but this really ensures it. Um, if I don't know whose work I'm looking at, then I, I can just kind of look at it with a completely neutral set of eyes. Um, and one of the other things that I have learned from other instructors is go ahead and set a timer. Um, I worked with a colleague who used to like to use an egg timer. They really liked how it, it physically made a little ding. Um, and then they felt that they gave the same amount of time um, to each student when they, when they graded their large assessments. Um, so this can help you kind of get into a flow. You'll know how long it's going to take you to grade. Um, but yes, once you had the student names uh, and you set a timer, it, it develops kind of this consistency for you. So another one that I have here is use interactive rubrics. Now I know that rubrics are not new, um, but sometimes I see people um, unsure how to use them in Blackboard Ultra specifically, uh, and they don't know why it would save them time. So this is kind of why I put this on the slide here. Uh, when you create an interactive rubric in Ultra, you'll create categories. So um, you'll notice, like, I think on here, we've got completeness, organization, consistency, um, ready to begin building. Right, so we had four different categories um, with point values. Each time I would click on that little arrow next to those four categories, um, I would enter the, the points that they had earned and the uh, maximum total score at the top would 
update automatically for me. I didn't have to manually go in there and type 90 points, 100 points. I didn't have to rifle through somebody's um, documents and then try to go back and adjust the score. So um, it's really just kind of a, a nice inline grading feature. Right, and I can come up with different um, levels for for point values. You know, I could have done exceeds expectations, meets expectations, does not meet expectations. You know, I, I could do as many categories as I wanted. Um, something else that I've learned about interactive rubrics that's really a time saver. Um, they have this uh, feature in there where you can do um, points. Uh, it's a points range. So I might say that anywhere from 10 to 15 points is meeting expectations. That actually can tack on more time than you think when you're grading, because now I have to decide, did they get 10 points? Did they get 12 points? Maybe they should only get 13 points. Um, and then students will want to know why they didn't get the full amount of points. So instead of using points ranges, I encourage you just to stick to um, kind of just one set uh, numerical answer. Did they you know, exceed expectations, meet expectations, or does not meet expectations? You know make it so exceeds expectations is 25 points, meets expectations is 20 points, and does not meet expectations is zero. Uh, and as long as you have specific criteria for each of those uh, numerical values, it'll make your grading um, a lot faster and students will be able to, to look at the rubric and look at their assessment um, and see why you arrived at that particular number. Does that make sense? Okay, not hearing any objections, so we'll move on. Uh, the other thing that I always like to encourage is minimal marking. Great, thanks. So um, minimal marking to me is this idea that anytime I provide feedback to my students, I'm really only going to mark areas of their um, assessment where they're going to have an opportunity to revise or to um, practice that skill again. So minimal marking is going to help you avoid auto-correcting. Uh, it's going to focus again on those future improvements and, and you wanna draw students into the revision process. So um, for me, again, I know I said my background's in English. Instead of going through and continuously marking areas where students forgot a comma, I might circle one sentence and say, I've noticed that you have a tendency um, to forget commas. This is an example of where you could insert one. Can you find the other areas um, on this page um, where you need additional punctuation? So you're asking students to um, look at your example and then to, to finish um, editing their own paper. So you don't have to cover their paper, so to speak, in red ink. Okay, the automated feedback, again, this is another um, Blackboard feature, but um, I do find it helpful. So anytime I have um, like a true false or a multiple choice question, I can give automated feedback. So I can tell them like, yes, good job, or okay, you were close, but not quite. And, and I could give them some um, additional information there. Um, Alicia, I'll get to that in just a moment. So, um, and you also have the option with automated feedback, you can you can decide when you want to release that feedback. So um, this is another great option with the Blackboard Ultra. It's under the gear icon, but um, some instructors want to wait until all of the exams have been submitted before they release the feedback. That's fine. Um, you can do that. There's a setting for that. Some people want to make sure that as soon as students hit submit, they can go in and see the feedback about whether you know they got something right or wrong. So you can do that as well. So again, it's up to personal uh, preference, but there's a lot of different settings that I think you can customize for your own needs. Um, and this will help you know, distribute the feedback without you having to go in and manually grade every single assessment on your own. 
So Alicia, when I have typically asked um, students to submit something and I want to provide uh, feedback, I usually ask them to upload a file. Um, I'm pretty much paperless, but I'll use inline grading. Um, and so there's an area in there where you can add your own feedback. It's and inline, go, it's, I'm sorry, it's inline grading a setting in the Blackboard area or? No, actually, are you downloading this is and sort of using track changes if you're doing, uh, if they're submitting something in Word and you're providing comments and then re So this screen that you see right in front of you, this is inline grading. If um, students had just typed in that little submission bar um, and they had not uploaded a document, I don't have all of these different features. Okay. Um, but if they say turned in an Excel spreadsheet, if they turned in a Microsoft Word document, um, it does not work with PDFs. So you might want to tell them don't do a PDF. Um, but again, like if they just give me a Word document like this, um, I have this little tool bar that I have um, kind of in the center of the screen that I've um, outlined with a red rectangle. Mm -hmm. um, that's inline grading. That allows me to um, give students this customized feedback. And um, so I can use the rubric um, to provide a score, a numerical score. Um, I can use um, the feedback um, comment section on the right. That's just overall feedback for the entire submission. Um, and then in the center of the screen, that little area there um, where I, I kind of circled it or outlined it in red, that part, they have things like um, a stamp. So if I find that I am consistently reusing um, certain comments, I can just save it to a library and I can just reuse um, comments. Okay. So you'll see it, like it says content library is empty. Add content to quickly reuse across assessments. So, you know, okay. Uh, if I all, all this time I was sort of overlooking that black toolbar. Um, yeah. So thank you for that. That that's really helpful. Yeah, it's really helpful, especially, you know, if you find yourself reusing certain types of feedback. Um, you know, I had an entire section in my course that was devoted to talking about the um, the thesis statement. You know, after a while, I got really tired of, of typing the same comments over and over again about the thesis statement. Um, mm -hmm. But I could save it to my library and, and I could just basically copy and paste it into the comment section. Um, so okay, it's a helpful, good. handy tool. Great, I can see that. Thank you. Great. Don't we always love when we find a new tool? <laughs> yeah. um, and then something else that I, I like to do with students, um, sometimes just writing feedback is in and of itself a lengthy process. So um, another way that you can give your students feedback is you can actually write in Blackboard, you can give them optional video feedback, or you could just record your voice. Um, so I, I took a screenshot again of, um, you know, a pretend uh, essay or, or assignment, anything you wanted where a student turned it in. Um, and when I go to feedback, um, you'll see, I think on the right hand side of the screen, there's a little plus button in a circle. If you click that little uh, plus button, it'll give you a menu of options and there's a recording right there. Um, so if you want your webcam on, fantastic, you can turn it on. If you don't want your webcam on, you can turn it off. Um, and you can just tell students your, your feedback instead of taking the time to actually type it. So you can tell them all the things that you thought they did really well and you want them to continue to do in the future, um, as well as some suggestions for improvement. Um, it is it is fully functional. I've tested it numer numerous times, so um, I know it works. And again, I think this could save you a lot of time. And students really like it when they can just click a button and they can hear your voice. So consider that another option. OK, I have two minutes, and we've arrived at uh, the final Q&A. Is there anything um, that I can answer for you? Oh, Jennifer, great. I, I'm glad you, you found a, a new tool. This is really helpful, Megan. Um, this is Jennifer. Just quick question. On the exit slips, 
So basically that's just some kind of survey or whatever you put up on yes. Blackboard then. Okay, call that it slipped. So yeah. Okay. Blackboard Ultra currently does not have a survey tool, which is oh, just okay. frustrating. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, but what you can do is you can ask your students um, to, um, you can just create an assignment and make it worth zero points um, and, and they can uh -huh. turn it in that way. Okay. And you kind of just put that in, and yeah, where, wherever in the class, just to kind of see. Yeah. Um, you know, if I'm, it, again, it depends on how my online course is set up. If I have synchronous course sessions, I might ask them to fill out a exit slip um, before they leave, and then I'll um, use it to also record attendance, you know, kind of do double duty. I get some feedback from them and they have to put their name on it so I know who attended class tonight. Um, otherwise, you know, sometimes I might just stick it at the end of a module and say, hey, you like this is one of your your assignments, like give me some feedback, you know, what went well for you this week? Um, what do you still have questions about? Is there anything else you want to tell me? Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. All right. Well, I think you've got a minute left, so I'll hang around if there are any other questions. Um, I'll also try to send you an email with a list of the various resources that we went over today. Um, but otherwise, I'll give you back your afternoon. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Thanks so much. Make it very helpful.